Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Alex Cormick. She's a public company lawyer. Uh, she got quoted in an article that I was really quite interested in in regards to crowdfunding in real estate investments uh, recently. And so I wanted to reach out to her to find out about real estate investment, because I think a lot of people have been investing in pre-construction condos and, and other things lately, which, uh, you know, given what's happening in the marketplace, may be less available uh, and less interesting than it was. But the idea of crowdfunding in real estate sounds fascinating. Alex Cormett, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. So tell me, is crowdfunding in real estate a real thing? Oh, it's been a real thing for quite some time. I think what's the difference now is that it's online. And so that's the crowd portion that is new is the online component. But real estate issuers have been raising capital using the offering memorandum exemption here in Canada for quite some time and quite successfully. In this province alone, in British Columbia, where I'm from, last year, there was over 300 million raised using the offering memorandum exemption, which really is the crowd uh, for real estate purposes. What what is, What is the offering memorandum exemption? If you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so the offering memorandum exemption is like a prospectus, but it's kind of a, a, a slimmer, uh, kind of tighter version of that document. And it allows issuers that prepare that document, which doesn't have to be vetted by a securities rate later beforehand, to go out and tap anyone for capital, meaning that you don't need to be an accredited investor, you don't need to be someone that's known by that issuer, and the only requirement really is that you receive that offering memoranda that they prepared in conjunction with that capital raise. What needs to be in an offering memorandum for it to be uh, applicable to get this uh, this exemption? Well, there's basics, you know, about the company, but also more importantly about how the issuer is going to use that capital and what other capital or assets do they have and already, and then what they're going to do for the investor. In other words, what the return is going to be. For real estate issuers, they often have to, they also have to provide information about that particular project and how they plan on spending the money. And if they recently purchased a property, i.e. for a development or something like that, they need to provide evaluation from an independent valuator that's within six months of the capital raise. Now, I would have thought that everything like that needs to get vetted by uh, the Ontario Securities Commission or equivalent uh, across Canada. Why is it that uh, you get to raise this money and not have to go through the, the typical uh, you know, OSC uh, review and approval process? Well, the idea behind the offering memorandum is that individuals are receiving enough information through that document, and that document does have liability to anyone that signs the certificate. So issuers... Uh, basically the directors, officers, the partners, uh, depends on how that business is set up, are required to sign a certificate that says everything in that document is true and doesn't have a misrepresentation in it. And so there is liability that's exposed to that. That document is filed with the securities regulators 10 days after any sale that's occurred, the first sale. And the regulators at that time will often take a look to check to make sure that one, that it's in the correct form, and two, that it is uh, provides all the information that they're required to provide. And so if something goes wrong, that's the document that the securities regulators then look at to see is there something in that document that uh, was misleading and that caused this problem, whatever the problem happens to be, and it's usually fraud, to occur. And, uh, and that's where it comes about. But the assumption is, is that you know, the issuers are being truthful and that they are kind of, you know, raising capital with best intent to do what they plan on doing. And it's only when there's issues later on that, that it's taken a look at. And so you're saying that crowdfunding online, what uses the same exemption to, uh, to, 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 to raise its money? Yeah. So what people have done now is, so the one that they referred to in the Addy article, like in the article in the Financial Post, they referred to Addy. Addy is actually using the offering memorandum for its trans, the uh, deals that it has on its site. And for, there's is another crowdfunding exemption called the startup crowdfunding exemption in Canada as well, which allows issuers to raise a smaller amount of money than what the offering memorandum. So the offering memorandum, what's interesting about it is there's actually no cap on how much you can raise. So it's an unlimited amount that you can raise under that exemption, uh, whereas the startup cap, the startup crowdfunding exemption does have kind of limits in terms of what you're allowed to do. What, what are the limits? So here in Canada, 
it's about, um, we just remember, it's about 1.5 million max in a 12 month period. And then the investor caps are different. As I said, here in British Columbia, we don't have investor caps on the offering memorandum, but there's investor caps under the startup crowdfunding exemption. So in addition to limiting it to 1.5 million, uh, the investor cap is, is uh, 2,500 in a 12 month period, unless suitability advice is received and then it's 10,000. So these online uh, crowdfunding uh, platforms, uh, the different real estate developers put them up themselves or are they marketplaces that are established where lots of lots of developers will put up opportunities what what what's the opportunity here if you know investors want to take a look at some of these opportunities so there are platforms themselves like front funder is one of them addy that was referenced in in um, the article is another one there's probably about five portals that are active with active deals right now in canada uh, down in the United States, there's more on the real estate side, but depending on kind of what exemption they're relying on, it may or may not be available to Canadians. And, and just so that you know, like down in the United States on their version of kind of the like regulation crowdfunding, over 368 million was raised under that exemption in 2022. And under their regulation A, which is similar to our offering memorandum, there was over $1.8 billion raised. Under that exemption. Sorry, the 368 would have been crowdfunding or or the crowdfunding. Uh... crowdfunding. Yeah, straight crowdfunding. And similar to our startup crowdfunding exemption, other than their regulation crowdfunding allows uh issuers to raise up to five million dollars. And then after the fact, are there obligations like reporting financial results or things like that? Under the startup crowdfunding exemption, there isn't. Uh, under the offering memorandum exemption, again, in British Columbia, Newfoundland, Labrador, there's no requirements. But in the other provinces, there are requirements. So, for instance, uh, if you raise, I always say, like, it's kind of like Hotel California, if you raise in Alberta or Ontario, you're required to do audited financial statements on an annual basis and to file those with the securities regulators in the provinces that you raised capital, as well as uh, make them available to to uh, your investors. Uh, you also have kind of uh, ongoing requirements if there's a material change uh, or if there's, uh, uh, and you also have to, in your first year, show the, uh, or provide a notice of how you spent the money. I, I didn't catch the, uh, the the connection to Hotel California. What's the connection? You're basically, you're obligated to keep filing. You may have raised, let's say 500,000 under the offering memorandum exemption, but you're required to do audit financial statements for the rest of the life of the company. So you keep coming back. Okay, sounds good. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and be back in just two minutes with uh, Alex Cormick, uh, a lawyer out of uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, who um, has specialized in in uh, legal work with technology companies, with real estate companies, with biotech companies, and is an expert on uh, raising money for real estate um, through this offering memorandum process, as well as crowdfunding, which is, a, I think, a trend that's really kind of interesting. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Our topic tonight is real estate investing, uh, in particular, in specific, uh, real estate investing through crowdfunding, which was uh, published in an article this week that I found really kind of interesting and I thought it would be good to check in with Alex Cormick, who is a lawyer that specializes in this area, about um, you know how it's done and is it growing. Um, uh, Alex, how did you get involved in this 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 area of business? Uh, it started with my first degree was regional urban development, land planning and city planning. And I had all intents of staying in that area. I uh, started working for a commercial real estate firm and uh, made pretty good money for someone in my age back at that time. Uh, but I saw the checks that the uh, the real, real estate salespeople were making in the office, and I wanted one of those checks. And so I wrote the exam, the real estate exam, which was quite easy for me to do, and then asked my employer to move me into that other position. And he just said, that's never happening. And I said, why not? He goes, well, you're making good money where you are. Stay where you are. And I, I didn't like that answer. So I went and looked at four other jobs to see whether I could get, you know, a real estate sales position someplace else in a commercial real estate house. And again, I went through the process actually with the old Campbell Corp uh, in Toronto, and I ended up being moved to their dialects division at some point in time. And I was offered a job working as a manager for one of the stores that they had. 
And so I said to the guy, I didn't apply for this job. I said, so what happened? Where did I get passed over? And he said, well, we think you'd be a good asset in this position. I said, this is not the job I want. So I went back and to the person who was part of the commercial division there and asked him what I needed to do to get that job and why I didn't get it. He said, too young, too pretty. No one's going to take you seriously. And I said, okay. I said, what do I need to do to be taken seriously? He said, get older, gain some weight and get another degree. So the first two, I didn't have much control over. I wasn't going to be gaining weight anytime soon. I wasn't going to get older anytime soon, but I could get another degree. And so that's what I did. So LSAT came before MCAT and that's how I ended up going to law school. So between first and second year, I worked for a litigation law firm because that's what you think of as a lawyer when you're growing up in the prairies and uh, didn't really like it, got really good experience, uh, quite interesting work, but it wasn't my personality because it's a win-lose type game. And so between second and third year, I worked as in-house counsel for NRS Block Brothers National Real Estate Association, which at that time had offices across Canada and United States, both branch offices and franchised offices. One of my jobs was to do the security circulars. Uh, so as a franchise owner to sell franchises in the United States, you have to do a securities prospectus, franchise prospectus, and that has to be qualified in every single state. And so that was one of my jobs and I really liked it. I liked being in-house. I fielded bizarre questions from the real estate office in some cases. And uh, and I really enjoyed kind of dealing with kind of the securities documents themselves and the other documents that we had in the office. So decided I didn't want to go through the same sort of thing that happened in my first career and decided to do a master's degree in cross-border securities law. And that's fascinating. How I- and, and, and now you do biotech and technology and real estate. Is that correct? Yeah. So I would say the majority of my clients have been in tech and biotech uh, and uh, and a smattering in mining because I am located here in British Columbia. You can't really get away from it. And then real estate. So let's uh, talk, if we could, about sort of the different ways that that real estate uh, can be financed. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of us know that uh, some big pension funds uh, will own real estate companies. Um, And then there's public REITs um, and then private REITs and then sort of uh, some of the other things that you've mentioned. Maybe start with a big and then, you know, if you could segment down uh, the different ways that uh, real estate companies can be structured in finance and what rules would apply to them. Well, that's pretty much kind of a master's course for like probably an entire season at, at school. Um, So real estate companies generally on the REIT side, so real estate, which is a a, uh, REITs really are something that has kind of really emerged from, I would say, the 90s forward. They did exist before that period of time, but I would say they really found their ground in the 90s and and started really gathering steam in terms of both size and also uh, what type of assets. So commercial real estate involves commercial buildings, i.e. office buildings, uh, they, uh, I would say condo towers that are managed rental, large rental, uh, it would be things like uh, industrial um, to a certain extent, but not really mainly on the rental side, like storage units and things like that, and on a wide basket of things. Um, so REITs generally are structured at using a prospectus and they're usually qualified prior to being sold and they're usually listed on an exchange like the tsx nasdaq or new york stock exchange you can have both public and private REITs. is that correct both private and public REITs. the difference of course is liquidity you can't really get out of a private REIT that easily usually you come in on a either a monthly or quarterly basis you can come in and out of the REIT, so they have to price it so someplace down the uh, down the line they have to price what that REIT or what that unit that you're purchasing is so if you have to get sort of regulatory approval of a public REIT what are the uh what are the filing requirements on a private REIT so private REIT again it depends on how it's structured so if a private REIT is a private REIT and it's just accredited investors or quibs qualified institutional buyers uh, they don't have any reporting requirements other than what they agree contractually with their their shareholders so what are accredited investors or what qualified institutions that you mentioned? So accredited investors are individuals or entities that have been defined as accredited investors by the securities regulators. So here in Canada for individuals, 
it's someone who has income of 200,000 or with their spouse, 300,000 combined over a two year period and with the expectation that's what they're going to have in the next year. Um, or they have a total financial assets of a million dollars, meaning your liquid financial assets or total net assets of $5 million. There's also for the individual, a 5 million financial asset test. And that really kind of puts them into a different level uh, in terms of uh, uh, protections and kind of puts them into a quib type category. Um, quibs are large institutional investors of a certain size. And again, um, they are a defined group of, of, of um, investors. And so they could invest in a private REIT without uh, that private REIT needing to file prospectuses, prospect I, I guess is the plural, I apologize, uh, with, uh, regular, with regulators and or financial statements uh, with regulators other than what um, they'd want to produce and send to their investors. Is that correct? Yeah. So it, basically private REITs are private REITs. So they decide what sort of documents. Now, some private REITs will use an offering memorandum. And if they use an offering memorandum under and use the offering memorandum exemption, they then have, as I said before, a requirement to do audited financial statements on an annual basis and provide kind of, uh, you know, uh, that one time, like how we spent the money type thing if they raise under that offering memorandum during the year. And mm -hmm. there are some issuers that are constantly raising. So a large, so some of the, you know, it's not really kind of the, um, what I would call the REITs themselves that are con constantly ra raising, but uh, certainly some of them are constantly raising. But uh, I would say that for kind of some of the uh, developers or even what you would call mix. So you have other instruments as well, right? Sorry, you've got REITs, you've got what they call mix, which is mortgage, mortgage investment corps. You've got developers, you've got people that are kind of doing one offs in terms of, um, uh, kind of a, a restoration or um, buy and hold. So you may have a, a syndication where someone has either syndicated a, a group of mortgages or they've syndicated a group of properties um, and that they then package those up. Uh, some of them are rentals. So you may have people that are in different segments where they are, you know, all Texas apartment rentals, for instance, where, and it may be different grades as well. So in real estate, you have, you know, your A, B, C, in terms of uh, what the quality of that unit is, both on the commercial side, the industrial side, and also uh, residential side. Um, so all of those factors play in and they all have different risk portfolios as a result. So diversifying yourself in real estate would mean diversifying yourself in terms of what sort of asset holds that you have and also the different risk levels that you have. And in all those cases, uh, if you, um are having only accredited investors invest. Uh, you don't have any reporting requirements uh, and uh, registration requirements, but if you use the offering memorandum, what's the benefit there? That you don't need to only restrict yourself to accredited investors, but you do need to file financial statements. Is that the difference? So hey, again, uh, that requirement is it, not applicable to British Columbia and Newfoundland Labrador, but in the other main provinces they are. Um, so you do have to file audited financial statements. You do have to provide a statement that first year of how you spent the money or in the second year, if you still haven't spent all the money and uh, any further raises that you do, you would still have that obligation kicking into the next kind of um, annual report that you did. Um, you would also have kind of, um, you know, you're going to have shareholders meetings and things like that. Almost all of the real estate deals that are done for kind of developers uh, obviously are set up usually as limited partnership because they have a limited life. They're usually between, you know, uh, anywhere from three to six years max sort of thing. It's how long that development is going to take to do. And then you're going to have your dividends out at the back. So during that time, you don't have any liquidity whatsoever as an investor. And so it, uh, so most, you know, uh, well-managed developers will be providing their investors regular updates on how the property is going, like in terms of their development and what sort of setbacks, if any, i.e. we didn't get, uh, you know, we didn't get a permit, the building permit that we thought we were going to get. We got this instead. And so maybe the project has to be changed or whatever, because real estate obviously is moving along um, in terms of, of different kind of issues and problems that may, may come up during time. 
um, be in part, uh, the ones, the real estate developers that use the offering memorandum that do that oftentimes can reach back into the pockets of those same investors over and over again. The reason why you'd want to use the offering memorandum is particularly right now, like in Addie's case, it was only $500,000 out of a much bigger, I think it was 8 million. I think they said in total that project was going to take to do that redevelopment in Calgary or Edmonton. Um, however, you know, that, that 500,000 is a drop in the bucket, you know, it's not going to get them, it's not enough equity that's going to uh, get them the bank loan or lending loans, uh, increased in any way, shape or form. In that instance is buy in by the community. So when you're doing kind of a crowdfunding, some of the reasons why you want to do it is you want the buy in from the community of your particular project or development. And it's buying social well, but it's also allowing people in the community to participate in kind of the business of the community and what's going around in their community. And also lets the developer know just how much interest there is in the future for that particular project. So if they are doing a housing development, for instance, or a condo development, or it's going to be rental units, and you have, you know, a, a large group of local people that want to invest in it, then that really kind of tells you that this is something that's going to be successful later on. Another reason that people would do it in this particular environment is you've got high interest rates going up. And so uh, as a result, you know, your ability to get loans are changing. So it used to be you could you could basically put 30% down and get 70% financing for a development project as you moved along through the different stages. That's not the case anymore. So you need a higher percentage of equity. And one of the ways to do that is to raise it with investors, depending on how you structure that. And that's one of the things we haven't talked about. So real estate, in terms of kind of an investment, can be structured in a number of different ways. Um, briefly, I mentioned limited partnerships. It can be set up as a corporation. But over and above that is what sort of instrument are you purchasing? What does that security look like? That security could be a common share or it could be a preferred share with a coupon on it, meaning that you're getting a dividend at some point in time. Or it, and it could be cumulative, meaning that you're not getting it today, but you'll get it at the end of the project. Um, depending on what type of real estate, it could be that you're going to receive uh, everything at the back end. So you may be getting partnership units and they may be voting or non-voting and it'll set out your rights and they may be different in terms of from developer to developer. They're not the same. So the things that investors should be looking at is what sort of instrument am I getting? It may be a debt instrument. So it could be a debenture. It could be a note. So promissory notes are securities too. And a lot of people get into trouble, particularly young developers that don't know promissory notes are securities. And you need to have an exemption in order to, to rely on to uh, sell that security or receive that security um, over and above just saying, I know this person. Um, okay, so, so you've described a whole bunch of different uh, investment structures. Um, and you're saying there's, uh, it would appear two major different um, exemptions for private companies. One would be this uh, accredited investor exemption, which is that they've got a certain amount of income or a certain amount of net worth that uh, that the Securities Commission says they're they're rich enough and smart enough, hopefully, and so therefore they can take the risk. Or you can uh, issue it based on the offering memorandum exemption, which you don't know. You no longer have that uh, uh, requirement to have only accredited investors invest, but you do now have a requirement to issue a offer memorandum, have the person sign it, you have to sign it, and then you have to comply on an annual basis with audited financial statements. Is that correct? That's right. And then the and the investor themselves, they're going to sign a risk acknowledgement, right? So they'll sign a risk acknowledgement realizing you know that there is risk associated with the investment and that one of the sections in the offering memorandum ex itself sets out the different risks that are associated with that investment and and so part of that is so that you know you realize that all kind of investments have a, a risk portfolio including you know leaving your money in the bank there's a risk associated with that but it's not often acknowledged like when interest rates are moving against you your money was worth less uh today than it was yesterday right so in terms of your spending power. So if we've got kind of interest rates going up, we've got um, cost of living going up and things like that, your money is worth less today than it was yesterday. So if you have it, have it invested in something that's at least moving, you know, uh, at a similar rate, you're better off in the future, right? 
sounds like it's a good idea to me. Idea to me. We're chatting tonight with Alex Cormick. She is a lawyer um, specializing in in real estate and technology and biotech, and particularly has an expertise in these online crowdfunding platforms and the uh, the regulatory processes that one has to go through. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and be back. And I'm going to ask Alex if this is really something that uh, regular people should be looking at. We'll be back in two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight with Alex Cormick. I read an article uh, just uh, last week about um, some real estate developers that were raising money through crowdfunding. And I didn't realize that that existed. So I thought it'd be interesting to check in with one of the lawyers quoted in the article, Alex Cormick, about uh, how and why this is happening. Uh, Alex, you know, I think a lot of people like the real estate business because it's got a big asset uh, that's uh, leverageable. Um, because it's a sort of a simple business or simpler than, you know, understanding the widgets and the markets and stuff like that, that you'd have to understand if you were into technology or biotech or something like that. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, a lot of the structures, uh, you get income on a tax free basis, whether it's a, a limited partnership or a REIT, um, uh, you get uh, pre-tax income that flows to you. And then uh, I think finally, what you're saying is that through these different processes, um, you can invest in it. And and I guess one of the reasons why um, I wanted to chat with you about crowdfunding is that historically people that were buying, you know, plazas or second mortgages or things like that were only wealthy, you know, it's always been described as the dentist lawyers and, and whatnot. So, you know, wealthy people, which I presume is your uh, accredited investor uh, 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 type people. But now with this crowdfunding and this, this um, offering memorandum exemption, it would be available for everybody. So I wonder if you could address that issue. Is this attractive because of tax? Is it attractive because of structure? Is it attractive because of the ability for um, you know, people of less income than previously to get involved? And is it therefore something that uh, you know every average day people should be looking at? I'm a big believer that every Canadian should own securities of some sort. I'd like every Canadian, regardless of what their income level is, to have instruments that are going to make them richer later on in their life, as long as they understand that not all of their investments are going to work out, not because of fraud. Anyone that commits fraud, a big hammer should be put on their head. But for, uh, you know, some businesses don't work out for various reasons. And, you know, we all went through kind of the big lockdown and we know that things can change quite quickly uh, that have nothing to do with kind of the, the person and the business that they're running. Uh, part of it, the offering memorandum exemption, the startup crowdfunding exemption, and some of the other exemptions that are available, like Alberta and Saskatchewan have kind of the small business financing exemption, which is another one that really allows, you know, individuals who are not necessarily accredited investors or meet kind of a friends and family def definition or a close uh, business associate definition to invest in things that they would not otherwise be available to them. Um, should they be investing real estate's attractive because we all live in houses, we all rent a house, we all live somewhere. And so we think we understand real estate because also it's a physical asset. We can see it. We can go and visit it. We can look at the ground where they're going to build something. We can look at the plants. We can visualize it. So we all believe that we understand real estate to a certain extent. But anyone that's uh, my age or your age knows that real estate is also cyclical. We have a bit of uncertainty right now because interest rates are going up. Um, we also have a little bit of uncertainty in terms of people keep on saying Vancouver, BC uh, and uh, Toronto, Ontario are going through kind of a, a bubble in terms of, of, of the real estate market. But that bubble, I don't think, is going to pop anytime soon because we've got pent up need for people to find homes. And you also have the rental. So you take a look at rents and home ownership and what people want. Almost everyone that rents wants to be a homeowner, but that's not always possible now. So here in Vancouver, my neighborhood, homes start, townhomes start at about 1.5 million. Well, for someone just starting out in their career, that's pretty, pretty difficult to kind of stomach and find out where you're going to, to get that money from. But it is manageable to think, hey, you know, on Addy, I can take $100 or $500 and invest in a piece of real estate. So I am part of that real estate market. Maybe I, I'm not a homeowner today, but I've got an investment in something that is related to 
real estate because you aren't directly invested in a, a piece of real estate in terms of you don't have ownership rights, but you're invested in either a partnership or a corporation that has that interest in real estate. And so that's one way that Canadians can participate. And I think that's that's perfectly fine uh, for pretty much everyone, depending on what your means are. So never invest more money than you can afford never to see again is one of the adages I always use. Make sure you got enough money set aside for kind of, you know, those unforeseen incidents that may happen in your life before you start investing. And those are just kind of basic kind of common sense things that we unfortunately aren't taught in high school or grade school that should be taught. But uh, don't be afraid of investing. So I think my first investment was the result of someone that I met in Arizona. Um, he actually used to be the superintendent of the Securities Commission there. He had retired and he started Arizona Angels. And I had met him at a NASA event, North American Securities Administrator event. And he said, hey, why don't you come down and see what I'm doing here with Angels? Because I didn't know anything about angel investing or accredited investors. And that was the first time I was exposed to kind of, you know, it, seeing myself as an investor rather than just as a lawyer working in this industry. And I know that seems a weird thing to say, but that, and I made my first investment at that conference and I continued to make investments. Um, and then, and that was a biotech company. Um, I would say that, you know, crowdfunding allows ordinary Canadians to invest in things that they know, things that they love or things that they want to support in a way that is accessible and affordable for them to kind of get their feet wet and kind of seeing how this goes. I would say you want to take a look at whatever documents that they're providing you. Take a look at if they've got like an offering memorandum or a startup crowdfunding circular or any other documents that they provide you. Pour over them and figure out kind of, you know, does this investment make sense for me? What's this person's track record? Have they done this before? What does this team look like? What is this area that they're going to be building? What is the, the building that they're going to do? Is this a rental property? I think rents, uh, rental properties, I think in a year and a half are going to be more uh, valuable than they are today. Rents have kind of kept down, housing prices have moved up, but I think that's going to be reversed in part because development has slowed. Uh, interest rates are too high right now. Pretty much lots of developments are on hold. Some of them, as you've heard in the news, have gone into bankruptcy can't proceed. Um, so you're going to see kind of a tightening in that rental market and rents are going to go up. And so there are a lot of opportunities in real estate investment right now. So I agree with you. I think that it's wonderful that uh, with this crowdfunding, uh, um, you know, what you've described as the offering memorandum exemption, uh, these opportunities are available to ordinary Canadians that, uh, you know, previously, I think were only available to the accredited investors, to the people that had uh, greater wealth. Um, and uh, so I think that is wonderful. Um, you've described well why it might be attractive in real estate. Do these rules apply in biotech and technology as well? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So, you know, we, we don't have as many... Uh, so the offering memorandum exemption, because it does have a requirement that audited financial statements be filed every single year, is not as attractive to tech and biotech companies, in part because they may be raising smaller amounts or doing a one-time raise. And they oftentimes, you know, have gone kind of the VC route, meaning uh, venture uh, capital pools of money, so management of some sort. And so the investment tends not to be... Uh, using it, it it's it's not a class of investment that tends to become available through the offering memorandum exemption here in Canada um where but they could but they could invest by way of either that uh accredited investor exemption and or the I can't remember what you called it but the sizable uh, institutional investor uh exemption is that correct so I, I would say you know the startup crowdfunding exemption so smaller amounts like a million and a half to be raised on that. And I think that really lends itself quite well to tech, biotech, and to a, a, a wide variety of other kind of sectors. And again, you know, the reason why I did the biotech one is I was giving money to charity. So I was in, you know, a friend of mine's daughter had, uh, and still does, has type 1 diabetes. And so I was giving, I won't say how much, but a sizable amount to that campaign every year. And then I looked how the money was being spent. And I didn't really like that. And I thought, you know what, I'd like to do direct, like, invest in direct research on that topic. And that's what I was able to do. And that's why I did it. And, and I loved it. And, 
you know, you get hooked because you now know that your money is going to work doing what you want it to do, which is look for something that's going to help people with type one diabetes in my case. And, and you're getting reports about how that's going and things like that and, and what sort of progress is being made or, or whatever. And, and you're, you're, you feel a more direct connection. And I think that's one of the things that I love about crowdfunding or, you know, private investing period. You're able to kind of invest in things that maybe are not mining companies, oil and gas companies, or things that are listed on the stock exchange, but they're valuable and uh, and are doing good work. You know, clients, different clients of mine. Um, I've had a tech client that was a gaming client. So they make games. And so they basically looked for uh, some investors and they got a few investors here in, in BC. They were all accredited. And uh, that particular company ended up being sold for over uh, $30 million three years later. So everybody who invested obviously got a big payday as a result of that. Um, another client of mine, they decided to do what they call perk crowdfunding. So perk crowdfunding is either pre-sales, I'm basically selling a product that I'm going to bring out to market, but I'm seeing usually they'll crowdfund to see whether there's any interest in doing and help getting kind of the money that they need to have the manufacturing done. Or they may do other types of perks saying, you know, um, I'm going to open up a donut shop in, in um in Toronto, and I want to see if people are going to like my particular kind of donuts, and I'm going to kind of pre-sale um, your package of donuts for each each month, each week, or whatever sort of thing. Uh, so this particular client, they had a sous vide product. So it's um, a sous vide is kind of a, a water bath where you cook food in. Uh, so it's a very niche type product, obviously. And they were looking to raise about, uh, they were going to be happy if they raised about $100,000. They passed $100,000 in the first hour the campaign opened. At noon, they passed 500000 By the end of the day, I think they were at seven hundred. dollars and, and was that online? That was online. So, so crowdfunding online. Crowdfunding, that was a pre-sale thing online. They ended up closing it out at about a million and a half. They got scared. They're going, I don't know if we can do this many products. The products are about um, $100 a piece sort of thing. So that's a lot of products when you've never manufactured before. So they were scared that we don't know if we can do this now because they checked with the group that was going to manufacture the product for them. And they said, we can't do an order that big in that time frame. So they had to find someone else. A good problem to have, but you know, for young people, there were two engineers and someone who is a foodie. Good and problem to have. It's a good problem to have. So you have this kind of opportunity with the crowd to kind of do something maybe you, know, you wouldn't have been able to do yourself. So I'm, I'm basically switching from invest in real estate to think maybe crowdfunding could help you in your business, right? So the startup crowdfunding exemption has no ongoing financial reporting requirements. It does have, as I said before, a cap of 1.5 million, but you can do a lot with 1.5 million. And is it a cap on any specific inv investor and how much they can invest? Uh, 2,500 uh, per investor, unless they get advice from uh, an investment dealer or an exempt market dealer, and then it's uh, they can invest up to ten thousand. Really fascinating. We're chatting with uh, Alex Cormick, uh, a securities lawyer, a litigation lawyer, a smart lawyer um, about real estate investment um, online through crowdfunding, uh, through uh, through the uh, offering memorandum exemption, through the accredited investor exemption. Uh, and doing it in tech and biotech as well. Fascinating conversation. We're going to come back in two minutes with some concluding comments. Stay with us, everybody. Really interesting. All about investments tonight. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. I've had a really interesting conversation with Alex Cormick tonight. She's a lawyer who um, was quoted in an article about crowdfunding in the real estate business, which I didn't realize existed. And so I was really quite interested to find out about it. And she's talked tonight uh, with us about public REITs and private REITs and uh, offering memorandum exemptions and accredited investor exemptions and crowdfunding. Uh, and it's been really quite interesting. Alex, you know, I've spoken to a lot of different people in venture capital and private equity and in real estate, et cetera. And they all say that the capital markets in Canada aren't as attractive, aren't as deep, aren't as big um, as it is in the United States. And so a lot of companies, they may start in Canada, but end up having to go to the United States uh, when they need to get funding. Um, people have commented about uh, 
about CPCs in Canada versus SPACs in the United States, which would be a whole nother conversation we might have at some point in time. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, if you're a mining company, you could get financed or oil and gas company in Canada. But if you're biotech or pharmaceutical or technology, you got to go to Silicon Valley or, or Boston or New York. What do you think we need to do in Canada if we want to have a better capital markets? Uh, so this is something that actually makes me angry. Um, so again, I primarily do tech and biotech companies. So I would say, you know, I would try to take those companies to the TSX Venture Exchange, the old, uh, the, its predecessor as well. And uh, our stock exchanges are really set up for mining companies and oil and gas. So as a mining company, you can have spent $100,000 digging holes in the ground on a piece of property that's about a city square block. And then have someone write a report saying, you know, spend $200,000 more over a two year period and go and raise, you know, uh, $400,000 and you're a public company. That seems bizarre to me, but that you can do that. If you are a tech or biotech company or even real estate, we'll get to that as well. You need to, as a tech and biotech company, you need to have spent about a million dollars on the research you need to be within a year of having a saleable product for biotech. That's not happening in anyone's business. Um, and, and even in tech, you know, you have to have a, a viable product within a year. And the preference is that you raise around five million in order to be listed. It's kind of an unstated amount. So, you know, it kind of moves up and down. That's what you need to be a public company. The difference between what we kind of reward. So I'm basically saying mining oil and gas resources, we understand that here in Canada, and we think those companies should be public. Tech, biotech, oh, that's people in people's head, that's brains, that doesn't have some attachment to land. We don't really get that. That actually, we need more proof before we're gonna let that out onto the stock exchange. Um, also, even when the company has kind of moved forward a little bit more, the valuation that you're going to get from the TSX Venture Exchange is money in. In other words, how much investment dollars in, and that's going to be pretty close to what they're going to value at. They're not going to say, oh, this is how much it's going to be. So I'll give you an example of one of the client companies we had. We wanted to list them on list them in our home territory, TSX Venture Exchange. Uh, so we were going to raise $5 million, um, didn't have any issues with that, all the parameters, it came down to what they were going to value it at. And uh, they have, you know, a, kind of an escrow thing sort of thing. And if it's outside of what their valuation parameters, they've got kind of these other kind of you know, other segmented piece of escrow. The valuation was just too low. It's, we said no. So we went down to the United States. We listed on NASDAQ at six times the valuation that the TSX Venture did for that company. Um, almost so, all so, so, you know, the first uh, issues that you identified are regulatory issues, uh, issues in regards to what the TSX venture uh, allows or, 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 or mandates before you can get listed. But the six times is a market. It's just that investors aren't willing to put the value in. And so it's our it's our it's, own it's, fault. The TSX, the TSX venture exchange says that's the value. They said they tell you we have a valuation. We come in with that valuation for an independent valuator. They basically say, this is what we think this is worth. And the exchange then says, no, this is what we think it's worth. And then we basically say, you can either take that or you're not getting listed here. Fair enough. So we go list somewhere else. That company went from, it started on uh, NASDAQ at $6 per share, and it went up to 90 bucks per share. You tell me what it was valued at, whether it was wrongly valued. So is, is it that the TSX venture is too risk adverse and so conservative or is it Canadian investors? I would say it's probably, you know, the TSX venture exchange obviously takes its cue from the securities commissions as well. Like the, all the exchanges have guidelines that are set by them and they don't want to get out of those guidelines. But we have a preference in our marketplace to value mining and oil and gas resources on real estate to list real estate companies they tend to gain you know we're not listing developers for an obvious reason they're building something and they're collapsing it developers usually end up incorporating or forming a new partnership limited partnership for each and every kind of development that they do part of it's for risk part of it's uh, for kind of making sure that that investment is isolated to that particular property that they're doing um so obviously they're not going to be listed but what you do have listed on uh, stock exchanges are things that are commercial you know primarily commercial real estate industrial real estate 
uh, things that are kind of uh, hold and rent type properties. Uh, those tend to get listed on stock exchanges. And that also includes people that are doing condos. You may have like large apartment building complexes that are rented out in different jurisdictions. And those have to be of size as well in order to be listed. And uh, that to me makes sense as well. But the result of that is, is we've got some real estate issuers, moving it back to what we're talking about, we've got real estate issuers that are using the offering memorandum exemption here in Canada, raising over 50 million each and every year. Um, some of them, you know, in certain years may raise up to like 200 or, or north of 200 million using the offering memorandum exemption. They never go public. Should they be public? They're continually in the market. Um, so, you know, you, you have to question whether our marketplace is broken in so far as that, that companies that I think should have more transparency and be public aren't going to become public because of the cost associated with it. And, um, and, and so that's a different issue. You know, tech and biotech companies, like I got pretty depressed for a while there because I think at one time I was probably either listing or moving 10, 15 companies a year to the states that started here, tech and biotech companies that should have stayed here in Canada, but couldn't get the love or the money and decided to move to the states. And, and we don't even look for money for a lot of my client companies. We don't even look for money here in Canada. And the reason why I got started in the crowdfunding and uh, even with the private capital market association and exempt market dealers is looking for a solution to have more stickiness where good companies and good people stay in Canada. You know, it's some of the, I, I, I've i talked to, to the Ontario Securities Commission, I've talked to the BC Securities Commission, I've talked to other um, entities and things like that. They don't see a problem. They they really don't see a problem in the system and how it's set up. Alberta, I think, is becoming more aggressive in part because the mandate, like, you know, the, the uh, Canadian Securities Administrators just put out their report uh, for the year. That report had nothing in it about capital raising, nothing in it. It had all focused on enforcement, all focused on educating about the risks, the bad, scary risks of investing so that the public doesn't get squeezed. Um, their enforcement actions against crypto and rules to kind of put up more roadblocks for people uh, that are in business to not do that business, i.e. crypto, uh, blockchain, that sort of thing. Uh, but nothing about capital raising, what they had done that year in terms of encouraging capital raising. Well, it sounds like we could do a whole nother show on how to improve the Canadian capital markets uh, uh, business and make it uh, better for capital raising, but we're out of time. Uh, and so I've got to thank Alex McCormick, Alex Cormick, I apologize, not McCormick, Cormick, uh, for joining us today and telling us about crowdfunding in real estate uh, and lots of other uh, ways that people can raise money and some really good commentary on the Canadian capital market system. We're going to have to have you back, Alex, because this sounds like a fascinating conversation. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.